All right, I'm gonna get started while uh, more people come in because I'm I'm just here for the housekeeping and uh, then I can pass it on to to the to the real show here. So welcome everyone. My name's Angie. I manage the New Ventures BC competition presented by Innovate BC, and we throughout the year like to do various startup seminars to give you useful information to help grow your companies. So we are continuing that today. We are doing a couple of seminars on our way to our awards ceremony, announcing this year's winners. I'll tell you about all that in a moment. So today's topic is going to be on uh, perfecting your fundraising deck. And we're really pleased and lucky to have Anthony Mushantov here. He's the head of capital at RBCX who joined on as a partner and sponsor with us this year. And Anthony's, uh, thank you for joining us, Anthony from Toronto. Uh, and I'm gonna pass it over to him very soon, but first I've got a few housekeeping elements here. So uh, first we are recording this webinar and we will make a PDF of the slides available and we'll send out a link to everything uh, for you after the, the session is over, but we do have a YouTube uh, channel as well and you can also access them there. Uh, for those who don't know New Ventures BC, or a reminder for those who do, we are a nonprofit here in BC. We're here to help BC tech startups uh, both launch and grow. So we're both, we're uh, most known for our annual competition, which is just wrapping up our 22nd uh, competition in a couple of weeks. But we also have a couple different accelerators for early stage and revenue based companies. Uh, just some upcoming things to tell you about. So we're this week we're doing an event on fundraising deck. Next week we're partnering with another partner called Backstretch Recruitment, and they're going to be talking about how to build uh, a team and how to recruit with a particular uh, eye on startups. So definitely they're trying to tailor it for the startup audience. So if talent is something that you are getting into, please join us for that one. And also we have announced our top 11 finalists in this year's competition. And the awards ceremony will be October 3rd, Monday, October 3rd. That's the only place we announce the winners. Uh, and uh, we have a stream going, you can join live or we also have an in-person awards ceremony. So we'll be opening tickets to general public tomorrow, but uh, we're including a link here today. So if you wanna join us in person, uh, please join us. And also just for the community, next week, our, our uh, friends at Entrepreneurship at UBC are doing a three-day immersive week of events. So uh, really, and it includes a lot of great networking opportunities as well. So definitely uh, check that out. And then our friends at SFE Venture Labs, they have a couple events coming up as well. Uh, or, or, sorry, I should say programs for startups around marketing and also market validation. So those are definitely also worth uh, looking at. And I think Liz is putting links to all these things in the chat for you. Otherwise, I'm going to thank my sponsors and I'll pass it over to Anthony to get started on today's topic. So our lead partner is Innovate BC. Our gold sponsors, EY, Faskin, SFU, VD School of Business, UBC Cider School of Business, Silver, Ace Tech, Telus Ventures, Output, Vantech, Angel Network, and Volition. And then we have lots of wonderful bronze and media sponsors here. Of course, I'll highlight today RBCX. Uh, and that's it. This is how you get a hold of us. Otherwise, I'm going to stop my share so Anthony can start his share. And I just want to say hello as well. I think I see Devin Thompson from RBCX here. So hi, Devin. Devin's been an amazing partner here in Vancouver for us here at RBCX. So thanks for joining. So hello, Anthony. You are welcome to join. Uh, share your screen and we'll get you, uh, we'll, we'll spotlight you for everyone. Great. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, is that visible for everybody? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Oh, okay, great. Um, so thanks again for having me. Um, uh, maybe uh, I'll do a very brief intro on, on me and then we'll jump right into it. I cannot emphasize enough, um, please feel free to jump in and interrupt me and ask questions in real time. Um, I'm a big believer in dialogue over monologue. And if you have questions, chances are um, others do as well. And um, questions are the best way to get to differentiated knowledge. So everyone's gonna prepare presentations, but um, catch me off guard with a weird question and you'll get something really interesting. So really encourage you to proactively interrupt me. Um, so 
Anthony Mushanta. So I, I guess, lead the capital practice at, at RBCX um, that today encompasses kind of two broad activities. Um, one is our investment management business. So we invest in venture capital funds. So we invest in the funds themselves, not in companies, but we also invest in companies. Um, and that's a very kind of different um, sort of framework. Um, I also lead our venture capital credit business. So we lend a lot to, to venture funds as well. Um, my background is venture and startup. So I came to RBC from Omer's Ventures. Uh, I was based in the Toronto and London UK offices. Um, and prior to that was a founder. So founded a company called Rhythm Technologies. Um, that was a direct to consumer uh, health tracking uh, and genetic testing business. Uh, ran that for a few years before uh, selling it to a pubco. Um, so that's me um, again interrupt me as we go. So um, this is sometimes this breaks down. So we're in the fund economic slide. Everyone sees what I see. Yes. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> fund economics. So how do venture capital funds actually work? Um, and some of you may be thinking, is this guy confused about what he's talking about today? Why is he talking about uh, perfecting your fundraising pitch deck? Why is he talking about fund economics and how venture capital firms work? Seems kind of incongruous. Well, um, I think the central theme that I want you to take away today um, is this notion of understanding your audience and this notion of empathy with the individual sitting across the table from you. So if you can understand what makes investors tick, what they get out of bed for, what their incentive structures are, what excites them, what gives them anxiety. If you can tap into that, you'll be in a much better position to pitch them um, on your business and in a much better position to put together that pitch deck. So let's start this with <clears throat> talking a little bit about fund economics and what the incentive structure is for venture capitalists. Again, I preface by saying this is institutional VC, so it could be different for angels, could be different for government, friends and family, but let's narrowly think about um, the venture capital ecosystem because chances are that's where you'll, where you'll be doing the majority of your fundraising over, the, over a, over a um, um, company life cycle. Um, so the 2N20 model is a standard fee arrangement in venture capital. It's true in venture capital, it's true in private equity, um, real estate, hedge funds, anywhere in, in, in kind of private asset management. And essentially what this means is that um, a fund manager, so a VC fund, right, doesn't just manifest money as they may seem to do on television. They're constantly fundraising. And they're out there convincing their investors that they have some proprietary knowledge or some proprietary pipeline to get them into the best deals, right? So they're going to third parties and saying, hey, give me some money to manage on your behalf. Let me invest it on your behalf. And if you do that, you'll pay me 2% of the total amount that I raise. So let's use the example of a $100 million fund as we kind of go forward today. Let's say I'm raising a $100 million fund. I'll go to my investors, which will be big banks, pension funds, corporates, and I'll say, give me $100 million. You pay me $2 million annually for the lifetime of the fund, typically 10 to 12 years. You pay me $2 million annually, <clears throat> and that'll cover my salary. It'll cover my travel, my office space. I'm going to hire a few people. It'll cover all the overhead involved with deploying that money. So you pay me that $2 million annually. And then if I return that money back to you, if I invest it and then return it, and on top of it, if I return you seven to 8% annualized, so every year compounding, I get an 8% return on that capital. If I can do that, then on the incremental amount, on that additional return I generate, I get to keep 20% of it, two zero, 20% of it. Um, so that's kind of the incentive structure for the VC. So there's a dual incentive here. So they have one incentive to raise a lot of money because the more money they raise, the more management fees they get, the more people they can hire, the more salaries they can make. In order to raise more funds, you have to show successful companies or companies that are growing and doing good things. But what really gets them excited is if they can perform well, return that eight, seven to eight percent annualized, which we call in colloquial terms, a hurdle rate. So if you can beat the hurdle, then you get to keep, you get to collect some carried interest. If you can do that, you get to keep 20% of the, of the incremental. And that can be huge, right? So if you invest in a Facebook or an Instagram or an Apple or whatever the case may be, or Shopify, um, you could create generational wealth there. It can be really, really significant. So <clears throat> let's go through 
you know, very briefly two examples. And I've used a fund that generates one and a half times its invested capital after write-offs on the on the left-hand side, and then a fund that generates three times its invested capital after write-offs on the right-hand side. And we'll talk about why I picked those two numbers momentarily. But um, if we go through this, this kind of life cycle on a 10-year fund, so let's say the fund raises $100 million. So that's $20 million in fees. So remember, it's $2 million every year. So if we assume a 10-year life cycle, that's $20 million over the lifetime of the fund. Let's assume the fund then has 80 million left to actually invest that it's not spending. So it spends, so it, sorry, it invests $80 million. And let's assume, and this is always just the case in venture capital, just the nature of the beast, there's going to be some write offs So there are going to be companies that are inevitably going to go to zero for a whole host of reasons. So let's be conservative and say that there's 20 million in write-offs. So of that 80 million that's invested, 20 million is, goes to the gutter. It's gone. Um, so what you're left with is a $60 million cost base. So you have $60 million of investment positions across a bunch of different startups. Let's say after your management fees, after those write-offs, you double that portfolio. So you do 2x on the 60 million, which in, stated otherwise is one and a half times your investment base, which was that initial 80 million. So let's say that's what you generate on the return then if you can do that, it seems pretty good on paper, right? Like one and a half times the fund is pretty good, but you end up returning 80 million to the limited partners. Then you repay the 20 million in management fees that you collected over the 10, mil the 10 year period. Then you return a pref return, a preferred return, which is that hurdle that we talked about, that seven to 8% annualized of 20 million to the limited partners. And this is a simplification. So the preferred return on a $100 million 10-year fund will be more than 20 million, but let's just, let's play along and assume it's 20. You return all that to your limited partners. You only have, sorry, not only, you have zero left. You have nothing left. So you collected salary over 10 years. You didn't get any carried interest, even though notionally the fund seems to have done reasonably well. But now if we move to the right-hand side, same exact fact pattern, but this time you 3X your, your investment base. Okay. So the 80 million that you invest turns into 240 million. Well, in this scenario, you return the 80 to LPs, you repay the $20 million in fees, you repay or you pay the preferred return of 20 million, suddenly you have 120 million left. You return 96 to the LPs, but you and your partners get to keep $24 million taxed at capital gains for any nerds in the room who are interested. So you see how the incentive structure changes and what kind of behavior venture economics will encourage. These fund managers recognize that they have a really high hurdle that they need to cross in order to be able to generate carry. And these incentive structure create, um, I don't wanna say a risk loving tendency, but certainly it's attuned to an asset class that's very comfortable with very high risk, but in return, it needs, to, it needs to have some line of sight on outsized returns. So I'm gonna actually pause here for a moment because we're gonna move on past fund economics here, but this is really important because I wanna plant the seed of what's driving uh, venture investors and, and, and how they respond to incentives. Any questions up until this point? And Angie, I don't know if I would see the questions pop up or if, uh, if folks can just jump in. Yeah, you can either unmute yourself uh, or just type into the chat if you have questions throughout everybody. Um, so there is a question here. What about from uh, Tejvir? What about carry? Some funds also have a carry. So that's what I'm, so that's the carry. So the 24 million in the bottom right hand corner, the 24 million to GPs, that's what's called carried interest. So that's that 20%. So carry, when we talk about carry, we're talking about that 20% um, of the residual after the hurdle rate. So I'm entering yet the uh, 20 million uh, for fee. It did, it did, they don't deduct it uh, in the beginning, yes. They get it like $20 million, sorry, $2 million every year. Correct. They don't deduct, okay. Yeah, they get 2 million every year, yeah. Sounds good. That's all for now. All right, let's keep going. So again, so why did I open this with talking about fund economics? Um, so when you're creating your pitch deck, 
It's absolutely critical to know your audience, um, understand and empathize with their decision-making criteria and speak to their interests. So present a compelling story for what they are solving for. So let's explore this a little bit more here. So, <clears throat> so why is all of this important? So to understand whether you assemble a strong pitch deck, you have to understand the unique incentives um, and you have to understand what the person reading the pitch deck is looking for. And this all goes back to telling a compelling story and telling a good narrative um, and getting people excited. So I have a quote here from a very famous individual that you're all familiar with. And he essentially says, the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda. Um, and that's really important. And storytelling in our context isn't always qualitative. It can be qualitative, but it's not always qualitative. So one of the most powerful ways to tell a story in business and to tell a story in venture is with numbers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. But when we're talking about storytelling, it doesn't need to be um, a kind of soft storytelling. You're taking a constellation of data, you're taking a constellation of different considerations and you're bundling that up um, into messaging that's, that's compelling and that's gonna get individuals um, excited. So from any stage from seed to IPO, pitch decks should convince investors that they have the right team and or product to build a substantial and sustainable company. So I've bolded a few letters there. So team in venture is incredibly important, right? Particularly at the early stages. Any sophisticated venture investor knows that at the pre-seed, seed, and even at the series A, the product that you're presenting to them is probably not the product that you're gonna, you're gonna scale with. There are gonna be pivots, there are gonna be shifts, you're gonna respond to market conditions. What they're really betting on is the team, is does this team um, have some unique insight? Do they have a particular stamina? Do they have a particular intelligence? Whatever the case may be, there's something special about this team. Um, team and or product, product, the product story, um, if you can get them excited qualitatively, that's really important, but telling a good product story involves number numbers more often than not. So how many people are using your product? What's their, what, how are they using it? Do they love it? Do they recommend it to their friends? Do they never stop using it? Um, those are all really important things that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, substantial here, using it as um, shorthand for scale, okay? So remember, their okay, venture investors are okay taking risk. They just need to see outsized returns. So you need to be in a really big market and you need to show that the business can grow really, really rapidly um, and achieve really meaningful scale, right? Because if you go to a venture investor and you say, hey, I'm going after you know, a $5 million market and I think that in five years I can do half a million dollars in sales, they go like, whatever, great, but that's not gonna move the needle for me in terms of my incentives. So substantial, big. Um, sustainable, staying power, right? So there are some competitive moats. This company can be around for a long time. It can generate a lot of recurring revenue. Um, that's also re really important to telling a story for, for kind of um, uh, velocity to, to exit. So I won't dwell on the last two bullet points. I think we kind of covered it, but um, I'm gonna move on here to some of the really important um, narrative elements uh, when fundraising. So, um, you know, tech and innovation businesses have very unique characteristics relative to um, the rest of the economy. Uh, and this is really, really important. And these are different um, fundamental essential characteristics. It's why our RBCX exists, right? It's based on this thesis that tech companies look and feel different than everything else. So what are the differences between startups, tech companies, IP-based companies relative to, you know, chainsaw manufacturers and, and, and seat cushion supply chain vendors? So <clears throat> first and foremost, so tech companies, their primary currency is growth and it's not profit. Again, what do we mean by that? This goes back to building a substantial large business. VCs are obsessed with growth because growth translates to scale, right? So short-term cash flows today and next year and the following year aren't particularly interest interesting when controlled for the risk that you're taking. So when you're taking a lot of technical risk, you need to price in that risk, you need to compensate for that risk with massive growth. 
And if a VC can see massive growth on the horizon, then they start to see dollar signs in their eyes um, because that means that um, they may be in for some carry. Um, many co tech companies have no CapEx, no hardware, and no variable cost or nominal variable cost. So essentially this means they invest a whole lot of money upfront, but once they build their product, they can scale indefinitely. They can scale across borders, they can sell their product anywhere, um, and there's no additional cost to every additional unit of product that they sell. There's some nuance there, right? Like it's not always the case, but by and large, that's how software behaves. Um, and it's not just software, it could be things like, think about you know, drug discovery and medicine, right? You invest a lot upfront, there's literally almost no uh, price elasticity of demand in those markets. So once you get the drug working, you prove it works, you sell a ton of it and, and, it, and it scales indefinitely. Um, uh, tech breaks down barriers. So, so growth in tech companies can be exponential, not linear, right? Again, if we go back to you know, the seat cushion manufacturer, they can only sell in to a particular radius around their manufacturing facilities, um, absent a lot of capital spend, opening new facilities, a lot of transport costs, all that kind of stuff. In tech, once you do it, you sell it anywhere. So the example I always give is when I, when I ran a tech company, we were based in Canada, everyone was in Canada. Um, our markets were in like Norway and Sweden and the UK. And that was just a function of, we liked those customers, they liked what we were selling. Um, and we went after acquiring um, the, the highest value, lowest cost customers anywhere in the world. We had that flexibility by, by virtue of the product that, that we're selling. Um, life cycles are very accelerated. So the best companies can go from inception to IPO within a few years. That's, complete, that's a complete paradigm shift. Um, and network effects and winner take all economics create a power law distribution. This is incredibly important. And I think any VC worth their salt um, knows this intuitively, um, if not more formally. A small percentage of companies will create and capture the majority of the economic value, always, in our industry. I'm going to pause again for questions um, momentarily, but I want to I want to hark on this a little bit more. So, <clears throat> I always tell founders um, the best way. So, so VCs are um, uh, kind of herd creatures, right? So they look for validation from people in their social circles. They have a whole lot of FOMO. They're really worried about missing out a great, uh, on a great company. And, and this is, again, this is differentiated knowledge. So this is a really important slide to take away as you build companies and fundraise for them. So the foundational risk of venture capital is not losing money. It's not, that's not what it is. No VC is losing sleep because they're afraid that some of their investments are gonna go to zero, not one. And this is unique of venture capital. This is not the case in PE, not the case, certainly not in real estate, not in mutual funds, not nowhere else is this the case, except in venture capital. Your foundational risk is that you miss out on an outlier company that's on the extreme edge of that power law distribution. And if you miss those companies, you can go defunct, okay? So this is, again, incredibly important. So if you think about a standard early stage portfolio, so if we take one that consists of 20 companies here, you'll have 10 companies that'll be written off or written down. So for whatever reason, they're just not gonna meet their potential. And that's just the, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, eight companies will kind of do okay. So either they'll you know, survive, get aqua hired, get sold for you know, their, their cost base or generate a little return. But then there's gonna be one or two companies that are gonna generate the majority of the returns for the fund manager. I've seen this time and time again, particularly in early stage um, portfolios. Not true of growth equity, right? Like not necessarily as you, as companies mature, the risk return ratio tends to, tends to change. But as you think about early stage businesses fundraising, this is absolutely the case. So investors are not afraid of losing money. They have dozens of shots on goal. They're completely fine missing the net 11 of the 12 times, but they are deathly afraid of missing Shopify or missing Lightspeed. That's their core anxiety. So when you put together your pitch deck, I've seen this mistake happen more, than, more times than I can count. There's a tendency among entrepreneurs 
to try to assuage any risks or perceived risks associated with their business. So they may say, hey, like, like my company actually is de-risked for so-and-so reason, or um, I actually have enough revenue that I can go profitable, you know, in six months and I can just kind of trudge along. I would recommend against it. Build a pitch deck to give them anxiety about passing on your company. And if you can do that, you will be massively successful um, at fundraising. I think this is probably a good place to, to pause. The one last thing I'll say before, I, when, when we talk about storytelling and narrative, it doesn't need to be overly comprehensive. So I see this a ton as well, where you'll see like 30 page decks with a whole bunch of detail going into cohorts and this is what we're doing and our product roadmap. You don't need to do that. And oftentimes being more succinct is actually a lot better. So keep in mind, these investors are looking at dozens, if not hundreds of these pitch decks in any given year. Um, Sid, my boss, always tells a story that the most effective uh, slide he's ever seen in his entire venture investing career um, was an entrepreneur who went to a slide that had churn. It was just a white slide with churn, and it was just one big zero. So if you think about the narrative impact of that, that's not complicated. There's no detail there. But the shock value of that, you go, wow, okay, so no one's leaving. Everyone loves my product. That, that stays with you. So that's kind of illustrative of that point. So anyway, I'm going to pause here and see if there's questions. Great. If you want to ask uh, Anthony live, just put your, use that like, hand up feature and it'll, we'll call on you. But uh, there's a couple in the chat here. Andrew's asking, do you ever foresee a time when tech companies currency is profit instead of growth? Um, probably not, right? Because I should be clear, like it's not that I'm talking about venture backed tech companies, right? So if you think about what is the what is the message that you're telling the market when you become profitable, right? You're saying, I don't know what to do with this excess profit, right? Like I don't see other markets that I can expand to. I can't see R&D initiatives that I can invest into. I don't see myself continuing to grow and getting to some form of critical mass. Now, the reality is a lot of this is pushed from, is pushed by investors, right? So that's the venture model is like burn a lot of cash, but get to scale really rapidly. And if you can get to scale, the thing becomes worth a hell of a lot of money. That's not, that's not a, um, that's not a value statement, right? It's not a prescriptive state. It's not that that's better. It's that that's the venture model. So if you're fundraising for your business, chances are you're fundraising in that framework. However, I've seen a lot of people become really, really rich bootstrapping companies and not achieving that ridiculous scale where they go, yeah, like I have a product, people like it, they're buying it. I'm going to go profitable. I'm going to make, I'm not going to, I don't need to grow hundred percent year on year. I can grow like one, 2% a year, but my unit economics are really good. I'm taking out a lot of profit. I don't have annoying VC investors kind of breathing down my throat. I'm just going to do this instead of, instead of fundraise and go the venture model. That's totally fine too, right? It's just a it's two different models of, of kind of how you approach the market. Okay, great. Uh, Chris is asking, how do investors emphasis expectation, expectations shift for non-software companies such as hard tech? Really good question. It's, so there's a famous adage that hardware is hard, which I'm sure you've heard Canadian investors say um, all the time. Um, <clears throat> With, with hardware or with, um, I'm trying to figure out how deep to go on this. So, so, you know, one thing I'll say is in software, which is kind of the default that, that I've kind of addressed here, um, you, are, you are dealing with um, market risk, right? Generally speaking, you're not dealing with technical risk. You're dealing with market risk. In other words, you're dealing with, will customers want to buy this thing? Will the market want what I'm selling? What will my competitors do? Will my product be better than my competitors? Will I have a good UI, a good UX? All that kind of stuff, right? But there's no, there's no question around, generally speaking, in modern software, about whether the thing can be built, right? Like whether it, it can get to market. Um, and, and this kind of framework applies really well kind of, you know, in that context, because once you get product market fit in that context, right? When you're dealing with market risk and you get product market fit, you abstract that market risk and then 
it's a hockey stick. Now in hardware or in drug discovery or in other like adjacent innovation-based industries that aren't necessarily software, you're often dealing primarily with technical risk, more so than market risk. Classic example being, you know, if you're trying to create a new cancer drug, you know, no one's going to be like, well, like, who's your market, right? they will be like, well, my market's people with cancer, right? So in, in that context, you're dealing with technical risk. So what investors are trying to wrap their heads around is, can you do what you say you're going to do? And typically markets with, um, with technical risk will have very low price elasticity of demand. In other words, um, the, the end customer is willing to pay a hell of a lot for whatever it is you're purporting to create. Um, and if you can then instead change your story, not to focus on market risk, but focus on the technical risk piece, then people will tolerate or accept some of that additional risk or operational complexity that comes with, that comes with hardware. Um, but there's no way around it, right? Like hardware companies are the first to get dinged in a market like this, right? Like you look at, think about, you know, Peloton and it's not just, it's not just hardware companies. It's companies that are capital inefficient, right? So cap companies that need a lot of money to sell their product that are low margin. Those are the companies that really tend to struggle in these markets. So, you know, there's ways to adjust your storytelling when it's, when it doesn't have kind of core software characteristics. Um, but it's generally a little bit tougher unless you're dealing with really specialized investors. Okay, great. Uh, this one, I mean, this one's kind of related. Colin, feel free to unmute if you want to clarify, but I guess uh, maybe this is more of a clarifying point. Colin? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can. Yeah, okay. I can say that. Yeah, just what, what I, I've found. And I'm not trying to be snarky here by saying saying this at all, but uh, certainly seeing this, I do most of my work in the U.S. with uh, with VCs and angels with what we're doing in the sport tech space and experience as a service. Uh that there seems to be this trend moving away from trying to go from the grand slam home run that one in 10 is going to support the, the other nine that fail. So, so I understand where you're coming from, but I just wonder, maybe this is Dustin in your portfolio and your, in, in your investment thesis that this works for you, but are you seeing in other sectors and other areas too, that perhaps this is the, the mindset is shifting a little bit or becoming a, a bit more uh, expansive perhaps? Yeah, so so short answer is no, not particularly. So my my perspective isn't on. So this isn't our portfolio. So this is looking at a bunch of different portfolios, right? So we invest in VC funds as well. So what we see in VC funds is the model I'm talking about here. But I'm being very precise, right? This applies to early stage funds, right? If you're a later stage fund, like as you progress on the risk return continuum, as companies become notionally less risky, the required return on those companies become a lot less extreme, let's say, right? So certainly this doesn't apply to series B investors, for example, right? Like no series B investor is going to be like, yeah, I'm going to lose 10 of my, you know, 20 investments and I'm still going to be okay. Um, but generally speaking, if you don't lose 10 of your 20 investments at like pick a stage, pick pre-seed seed, you're probably not taking enough risk. Um, so I think, no, this is absolutely still the case early stage, generally across the board. I think in this market though, as well, um, and you gotta be careful about this stuff, right? Cause, um, there's a lot of nuance. Um, this isn't, this isn't, you know, cowboy investing is what, not what I'm going at. Right. So th th this doesn't abstract good business fundamentals, right? So this doesn't mean that gross margin isn't important. It doesn't mean that capital efficiency isn't important. All those things um, are still important. So I suspect what you're sensing and what you're seeing in, in parts of the US and, and maybe within your network um, is investors reverting back to some semblance of quality, right? So not just pure momentum investing, not like throwing money into anything and hoping that it turns into something, um, into something good, or frankly, hope that you know, the next investor down the line holds the bag. Um, that's not what this means, but but certainly in this market, um, you tend to have a reversion to just business fundamentals, good companies. Oh, well, fair enough. No, thanks for that. I guess that other piece too is is so many investors now looking at the social impact piece too, and that's just part of their thesis also. So as far as you know, a twenty x or a hundred x uh valuation isn't necessarily what they're after you after yes obviously want to make some money off, off of it and get a return but it's just one of the factors not the uh the north star necessarily 
Totally. And that's the point. That's the point, right? Like at the end of the day, the more important thing is know your investor, right? Like these are necessarily generalizations, right? Like there may be an investor that doesn't conform to this default persona, right? Um, ESG investors being being one class of investors that that meet that, right? So the, the, the more important theme here, I think is, you know, recognize what the VC um, archetype looks like, right? Like generally speaking, what gets them what gets them up in the morning. But more important than that is recognize the individual idiosyncratic incentives of the individual sitting across the table from you. And if you can do that really well, you'll do phenomenally well fundraising. Yeah, well, that's I totally agree with that. Uh, that old adage of, you know, I, I've grown the, the most delicious peach ever here. Try this peach, Anthony. But it's like, you know, I hate peaches. But no, 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 no. Try this one, though. It's like, you know, if you hate peaches, you ain't going to like my peach, even though it's the best peach in the world. So uh, totally agree with that with Know Your Audience. So, so thanks for all that. Great. Thanks, Colin. Uh, okay, a couple more quick ones. Uh, Tajvir is asking, what are the main differences comparing Canadian to U.S. VCs, if any? Mm, so it's a good question. So there's a really common trope um, that um, American VCs kind of shoot more from the hip. They're more uh, tolerant of risk um, and that they're a lot less um, sensitive to valuation. Um, uh, those two things tend to be true, right? Like which I've said publicly before, certainly um, at the mean. Um, but it, but you probably can't infer much about the individual VC that you deal with based on that. I don't know why that's the case. I have two theses for why that's the case, and our team's actually looking into it a little bit now. Like, I think one thesis is that there's a cultural difference between Canada and the U.S., and I think that can be, I think you can justify it. I think that's quite potent without boring everyone with the kind of sociological history of two societies. I do think the U.S. generally um, is more prone to risk taking and. Um, by extension, I think entrepreneurship is generally more celebrated in the U.S. and the U.S. is a lot more tolerant of um, failure than Canadians. I think there's a tendency among some in Canada's business community to not only dislike innovation, but kind of hold it with a certain level of contempt. Um, and I think we certainly um, judge people uh, who fail in air quotes um, more harshly than, than they do in the U.S. So I think there's a probable... Um, cultural component, generalizing, realizing this is recorded now, and I'm kind of questioning um, sort of how how uh, transparent I should be. So that's, I think, the first the first uh, hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that it just comes down to um, supply and demand of money, and I think this is equally likely is that just U.S. capital markets are more mature and more developed and more specialized such that there's just more money chasing uh, less, this is weird, okay, like semantically, more money chasing less great companies, um, uh, the ratio of that, if that makes sense. So there's more money in the US just because it's 10 times our size. There's more amazing companies in the US because it's 10 times our size. But there's more of a lift in available capital in the U.S. relative to the lift in great companies in the U.S. And so it just the clearing price on valuations um, tends to be a little bit higher and, and investors are willing to take a little bit more risk. So um, I think it's one of those two things that's the likely culprit. But um, that's kind of the, the core difference. It's just it's there's just a lot more money um, in the U.S. And you can take a lot more shots on goal um, if you build out your network there. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, one more from Z. What's the ROI timeline that VCs are willing to bet on for pre-revenue startups, but with an exponential growth opportunity? It's a good question. So, um, uh, so a few things. So, the VC fund life cycle will tend to be ten to twelve years. Again, generalizing, right? So, this is the case in information technology and climate or um, even deep tech, that fund life cycle can be a little bit longer and we're starting to see more 15 year funds, 17 year funds. So it depends, but generally that's the first kind of control is within the fund life cycle. So they need to invest, see a return, divest, return the capital within that 
call it notionally 10 year period. So that's the first thing. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that there's a, there's a time value to money, which, you know, kind of business 101, but is really potent in, in VC, right? And essentially the value of a dollar today is more valuable than the, than the dollar tomorrow. But if you think about things like, you know, you could say, I don't know, I'm going to build a quantum computer and um, it's going to be a trillion dollar business in 20 years, I'm being facetious. That's not actually that, <laughs> it's not that valuable, academically speaking, in this context, right? Because you're hitting a moving target, right? Like you need to get, you need to put capital to work, you need to get it out quickly enough so that the faster you get it out, the better your internal rate of return. And you need to get it out within that 10 year period or within the kind of one to two year grace period. So within those parameters, I would say it depends. I hate to say it depends, but it does, it does depend. But as you craft your pitch deck, generally don't, don't um, focus, don't think too long term, have some shorter term benchmarks or things that you can accomplish in the short term so that VCs can get lift on their investment. Um, the other thing I'll say that's really, really important really important. Um, you know, a, a venture investor certainly values exits, probably more than anything, good exits. So get the money out and give it back to LPs. But they also really value your ability to then fundraise at higher valuations. Okay. So this is one of the worst kept secrets in, in venture is that, you know, if I have a startup and I raise money at a $5 million valuation, and then I go out and raise money at a $10 million valuation, my first investor is going to what's called write up that investment to 10 million. So they're going to tell their investors, hey, that investment is now worth $10 million, regardless of the likelihood of that company then going on to be successful and growing and scaling and whatever. On paper, they're going to say it's now worth $10 million. I've doubled the value of my portfolio that helps them a lot, a lot, a lot when they then go back out to fundraise, which they want to do because then they get the management fees, they get more shots on goal for carry and all that kind of good stuff. So, you know, even if you're not divesting or getting liquidity on your company, if you can tell the story that you're going to be able to raise more, um, then that's really valuable. All right, that's, that's all for now. Okay, great. Um, so essentials of storytelling, everyone has seen this slide before or some permutation of it. Um, I think if you put in pitch deck in a Google search, you'll get something like this. So I'm not going to dwell um, too, too much on it, but it was just one of these must have slides. And I think everyone will have access to this um, uh, later. Um, so you know, six essential elements of any kind of pitch deck. So what's the opportunity? You know, why is this a compelling opportunity? Um, what problem are you solving for your customers? Um, you know, should we pursue the opportunity? Why now? Is there some, you know, market change that's 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 happening that that makes this more interesting? The classic example I like on this one for the why now is um, we were looking at a um, a synthetic biology company which essentially uh, like modifies DNA and microbes to make them do stuff. Um, and there's a great answer to the why now, and it was just a precipitous drop um, in the cost of sequencing DNA and synthesizing DNA. So when you see stuff like that, you go like, oh my God, like we're a little bit ahead of the curve here. We see that there's some foundational shift in a market that makes something possible. Um, if you can point to that, really valuable. The other thing that's interesting is you might, you might have seen companies in your space that were a little bit too early or that have gone defunct. Being able to point at you know, diagnosing what happened to those companies that were competitors or kind of looked like yours um, and talking about how that no longer applies can be really, <clears throat> really valuable um, from a narrative standpoint. Um, market, what's the size of the market? How quickly is it growing or evolving? What are the market dynamics at play? What does the value chain look like? So this is important. Every slide will have this, like the market slide, like we are in a $30 billion industry. That's not what I mean. Um, by market, like you can gloss over it, but that doesn't really tell you much. This is more of a, like, what are the particulars of this market, right? Like, like what does the supply chain and the value chain look like? Like who sells to who at what markup? Where is their opportunity? 
you know, who has the buying power and the selling power at different nodes in the value chain, like having a like in-depth um, presentation of a market and being able to situate what you're doing within that broader context is really compelling. Um, competitive landscape, you know, this is also important. Um, talk about who your peers are, what are the industry KPIs and benchmarks, but also talk about what's your unfair advantage? What do you have? What do you bring that's different than kind of what competitors have? Um, if there is a competitor that's further along than you, so that's, you know, raised more money, has more customers, has whatever, um, important to call that out and tell a kind of second mover advantage. Like, what are you seeing that they're not seeing? What do you have as kind of, what advantage do you have being able to be more nimble, kind of entering the market second, all that kind of good stuff. Um, traction, how's the company progressing so far? You know, early stage, um, obviously you might not have traction. Later stage, this is, you know, essential. Um, um, quantitative metrics are really, really important um, to traction, whether that's later stage or earlier stage. And quantitative metrics don't need to be financial metrics. So um, you can tell a story around <coughs> product market fit um, by pointing to, you know, cohort analyses, usability, stickiness, uh, referral rates, all that kind of stuff. Similarly, if it's a later stage business, you want to talk about your, you know, top line growth, your gross margin, how much money are you spending to acquire customers, what's the lifetime, but all this kind of stuff. But, you know, traction, if you can skew towards the quantitative, it's, it's a lot more powerful. Challenges are important, doesn't need to be negative, be quite transparent. Um, here's, here are the roadblocks, here's what I need to succeed, and here's how fundraising will go towards alleviating those roadblocks. And then team is always paramount. Um, what's, what's kind of so special about your team? Um, again, I know this is uh, probably something that you've all seen, but just for good form, I'll, I'll pause here um, in case there are questions on this. No questions at good. the moment. Yeah, we're good. Great. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry, I was trying to um, raise my hand. Yep. Um, I was curious on like um, the size of the market, especially if you're looking at film, I guess maybe in the in the going forward, but do you have any recommendations like where to start researching some of those data points? Um, yeah, uh, so um, did you say in film specifically? Yeah. Yeah, so so I um, candidly, I don't know. I don't I, I can't speak kind of authoritatively on on film with any um, real kind of wisdom. I, I think. Um, you know, the market commentary is, you know, when you talk about something like film, there's some markets that are just intuitively large markets where you don't necessarily need to pull in kind of hard and fast top line numbers. The more important thing on market, as I say, is um, being able to speak more narrowly to dynamics within, call it sub markets, right? So you know, in film, depending on your company, like what does your company do precisely, right? And, but then how do you go from film to distribution to licensing to all this kind of stuff? Like what's the supply chain in film? And then specifically, where do you, where do you play, right? Like where do you have value? Um, it doesn't need to be quantitative. Again, like it's, it's, it's really cool as an investor when companies educate you and have insights that you wouldn't otherwise have. And oftentimes that can be qualitative in terms of, you know, where to get that information. It's tough, right? Like it's a mix of primary and secondary research in terms of the secondary research. Like I think you're probably stuck doing a Google search and seeing what you find and um, just rummaging through the internet. Um, but primary researchers is also really, really valuable from a market mm -hmm. research standpoint. So talking, like literally talking to people being like, hey, like, what are you seeing? Like, what's the size of your mm -hmm. bit? Like, okay. what's the size of your licensing, yeah. right? So, um, so you're unique. Uh, so is your story. So situate where you are in the stage of your business. So uh, pre-revenue companies, you know, tell a story for founder product alignment. Um so do the founders have relevant experience to the company they're building? Do they have previous entrepreneurial access, prior industry experience or expertise? Again, this is really important, right? For pre-revenue company, investors are betting on the team. 
Um, so differentiating the team and why they're special is paramount. Um, Non-revenue proof points, pilot success with major clients, are people using the product? Is there low churn? This goes back to this quantitative storytelling around product market fit. Um, it doesn't need to be that the product is in market and, and, and selling at a very high velocity, but pointing to particular data points for usability, why people like it, mega important. Um, revenue generating companies, so you've got financial metrics. Essentially at the growth stage, there's a bit of a, you know, $1 goes in, how many dollars um, come out? Um, you want to show high year-on-year -year growth. Pardon me. You want to show high gross margin, capital efficiency. You want to establish that you're a product business, not a services business. You see this mistake happen a lot. Um, so you're not selling a consulting business. Um, product businesses tend to be high margin, much more scalable, low human touch. Um, that's important. Um, and look for strong gross margin capabilities and scalability. Gross margin tends to really um, accentuate at scale. So even if you have a low gross margin right now, for whatever reason, it's more important that um, you can tell a story for where gross margin is going. Important benchmarks. Again, take this with a grain of salt. Depends on the industry. Depends on the investor. Depends on macro conditions. You want to be growing ideally in the venture space, 60 to 80 percent year on year. Um, ideally. Um, you want to be at 100%, that's probably kind of best in class. Once you get below 30% year on year growth, you're getting into lifestyle territory, um, which goes back to the question at the very beginning on profit against growth, it starts to become <clears throat> a lot less interesting. Gross margin best in class is over 80%, um, but that's really, really rare and difficult to get. If you can get in the 70s, um, that's typically what investors are looking for. Um, below 50, it becomes, you become, you, you know, you kind of fall into the um, sort of capital inefficient box. Questions on this are pretty intuitive. Um, Han is asking, what is a good EBITDA percentage? Um, zero or no, <laughs> yeah. So again, like if you're if you're doing if you're EBITDA positive, um, generalizing, um, uh, you should think about whether you want to take in external capital. Again, that's not a value statement, right? Like if you're EBITDA positive at a particular stage of growth, like screw VCs, right? Like why invite in externals that are going to be kind of a pain to deal with? Just run the company the way you otherwise would, and think about whether you should take an external capital, scale the business, or just run a profitable business um, in perpetuity. Um, but I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen an EBITDA positive uh, company, frankly. The wrong person to ask. Um, so this is a little bit more of the same. Um, since everyone's gonna have the deck, I don't need to harp too much on this piece. This is. You know, the crux of this is that focus shifts as, as ventures grow, as companies grow. Um, so, you know, very early stage, the emphasis is necessarily on team. Um, as the business grows or as you go out to raise more money, uh, the emphasis starts to shift on product market fit, right? So you're trying to de-risk some, some of the instability in the business. And again, just tell the story about product, market, why they work with each other. And then as you grow more and more, the, the emphasis turns to quantitative analysis. Um, and then finally, as you near IPO, funny enough, it goes back to team. Companies tend to do a lot of introspection before an IPO and think about you know, the differences between a team that can run a private business versus one that can run a publicly listed business. Um, and so the point with this is situate you know, who your pitch deck is catering to and your stage of business. Um, and hit the points that are really important to, to investor at that stage of business. And I think we're, I think we're done. All right. Awesome. Thanks That's everyone. Good. Thank you for, for your time and for the presentation, super insightful. Uh, and thank you to RBCX for uh, helping us make this happen. So have a great day, everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll send the recording out uh, in the next day or so. Okay. Take care everyone. Bye.